thank you so much. Give it up for Pastor Gray. He's just so wonderful to me. He's so wonderful. He has that, that gift to make everybody feel special. All, all of us feel very special. Everybody that's, that's around him feel like he's just so loving and so humble and he's just so concerned about you. But I, I want to make an announcement that um, I told him the other week that I think I'm his favorite. Okay. <laughs> but that's the gifting that he has. Is he has the ability to make all of us feel like he's your, your favorite too. But be his favorite, Pastor Vaughn, all of us feel like the favorite because he has such a warm and loving heart. Give it up for him again. <laughs> now he loves all of us. He loves all of us. Amen. So yeah, um, I bring greetings from all nations, worship assembly. Oh, they was quiet that time. I was crazy. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was crazy because uh, lifesavers, we just be so, I mean, so turned, just so, so, I just apologize everywhere I go, like, I don't know what to do because we make so much noise. So they say you reproduce after your own kind, so I can't be upset uh, because maybe some of that is me. <laughs> so you could imagine. So I, I really do appreciate you all sacrificing. We were in prayer last night, and then uh, tonight we're here, and then tomorrow we have an outreach. It's going to be 90 degrees, so we're going to be out doing a, a cold water outreach tomorrow. And then we have class from 7 to about 10 o'clock uh, Thursday night. So they, they look at my room. Did she just say 10 o'clock? <laughs> Absolutely. Come on, like, say we shout 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock! <laughs> oh, goodness. So, are y'all ready tonight? Yeah. Uh, today is actually a, a, a special day because my manual, the evangelists are coming, is out. Yeah! And, uh, <laughs> awesome. and uh, we do have a few tonight if you would like to purchase them. I do encourage you to purchase them to help us do what we do. So they're about $15. And the full was written by the great and wonderful Pastor Greg House. Yeah! Uh, yeah, that should be the answer that. That, That's awesome. I was reading his forward and wondering, who is he talking about? <laughs> this is cool. This is cool. So, yeah. So, the evangelist is coming. That The manual is out today. So, let's review. Father, breathe on your word. Give us articulation of speech and talk through us. Let there be a wind of compassion to blow in us in this house on tonight. We honor you, Jesus the King. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we were here a little while ago. We were talking about the evangelist, the, the evangelist and Jesus being our evangelistic model. Anybody remember that? Yes. And Jesus went about, come on, talk back to me. Yes. Anybody remember that? Yes. Yes. So Jesus being our evangelistic model, that he was the first um, to be itinerant because he went about and he was teaching in all of their synagogues and he was casting out demons and all of that good stuff. And then we were talking about evangelist, the person. We were talking about the different characteristics of an evangelist, meaning that, number one, evangelist is human. You have to be human in order to be an evangelist. You can't be an animal attempting to evangelize. You have to be human as well as itinerant. And we, talk, we also talked about the opposite or of uh, things that, that could be deadly. Uh, if you don't use the evangelistic gift uh, as God has ordained you to use it, such as being itinerant, you know, you travel, you move about, but if you don't watch it, you could become unstable, and you can be an impulsive person so that anything that God gave you to be a blessing in the earth could actually turn out to be to your detriment. Are you listening to me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so then we had, um, uh, we talked about being itinerant. Uh, we talk about being direct, that evangelists are very direct people. We don't really live in the great area. And so you have to be very careful when you're talking with an evangelist because, especially today in today's society, where everybody is politically correct. You know, you talk to an evangelist, they may not be politically correct. They may literally tell you, in no uncertain terms, you're going to hell. They may tell you. <laughs> Y'all don't like that, huh? 
I told you, man, they always got to send somebody to hell um, at least once in the teachings. I got math out the way in like the first four minutes. All right, so evangelists are very direct, so they're not the one to talk to. Uh, if you need something in the great area, be wishy-washy. They're probably going to hurt your feelings, and you're going to say things like that, that they're arrogant, they prideful, and they're not relational, and they don't know how to interact with people. I'm telling you, I have heard it all. But really, I'm direct, and it's the way that the Lord made me. Come on and shout hallelujah to him. Since I've been teaching this, though, I like this. Because people have stopped asking me all those nonsense questions, because now they're afraid of what my answers may be. So I kind of like that. Y'all okay with that? All right. So evangelists are not only direct, but evangelists preach and teach and cast out demons. Come on and shout, cast out demons. There's some about casting out demons that kind of get evangelists going. Come on, say it, shout it again. Cast out demons. Cast out demons. I'm telling you, when, when people start manifesting, you can, you can look at evangelists. They start looking all out the corner of their eye because they just want to get in. It's like, tag me in. You know, let me just say, come out from the root just one time. We love to cast out demons, all right? Now, the flip side to this is that we have to be very careful. Because we will see demons everywhere. You end up being spooky. One of them people that you know you can't eat dinner with because they see demon all in the soup. <laughs> like this is the ABC. You see this Z over here. Don't go over there. This is the devil. This is just a rebellion. I'm like, this, no, 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 no. This is a regular soup. I'm listening to you. <laughs> so you got to watch it because some of them evangelists get real deep on you. They see demons and devils everywhere. They have a flat tire and they just sit in the car. Speaking in tongues, bad in the devil. I'm like, no, you probably want to call your roadside assistant <laughs> and get some help out here. Speaking in tongues and casting the devil out is not going to help. All right, then we talked about the uh, types of evangelists. We have the apostolic evangelist. Um, the apostolic evangelist is the evangelist that pioneered. Um, their, their work is kind of hard to replicate. People like uh, Billy Graham and Amy Simple McPherson, those are like apostolic evangelists. Like, everybody just don't do what they do. Uh, it's something that you probably take uh, multiple decades to kind of replicate, if you can replicate it at all. Then we have the urban evangelist. Now, I tell people I'm an urban evangelist simply because the, the, the term urban actually uh, can be associated with, like, inner city. But really, that's not what that is. Really, the urban evangelist is um, an evangelist who... Uh, can deal with the diversity, some, something similar to how that the city life is really a life, really about. And so that's the urban evangelist. The other evangelist that I was hurrying up to get to tonight, so it seemed like I'm rushing, I'm rushing to get to this one right here. This is the revivalist evangelist. Come on, shout revivalist. revivalist. Y'all ain't shouting. Y'all making me nervous. I say, come on and shout. I'm, I'm, I'm not hard of hearing. Come on, y'all ain't going to scare me. Come on and shout revivalist evangelist. Revivalist evangelist. We almost get that. One more time. Revivalist evangelist. Revivalist evangelist. And that means exactly what you think it means. A, a revival is a unique circumstance when the presence and the power of God manifests. Uh, but listen, y'all, it's not this thing that people do. When I start studying the revivalist evangelists and revivals and uh, 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 past revivals, especially in America, one thing I realize is that our definition of revival is nothing near what revival really is. I have started seeing people put revival on their poster and on their flyers to come to their church because this is going to be revival. You know, this is going, and one thing about a revival is man cannot manufacture it, man cannot organize it. It is something that comes from the hand of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So you cannot predetermine that tonight is going to be a revival. That's something that only God and the Holy Spirit can orchestrate. Now, God does use individuals like uh, William Seymour with the Azusa Street, that he was a revivalist evangelist. I believe personally, because revivals are meant to start or to ignite an interest in God. It's called an awakening to cause believers to have a reawakening in the power of God. That's what a revival is. I believe that that's one of the things that we're missing right now in the church. Is that many of us are not, number one, woke. 
And those of us who was once woke, we went back to sleep, and now we need a reawakening. Do you remember when you first got saved? I can't hear you. Do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember how church used to be real short when you first got saved? You'd be like, we got to go home already. Do you remember how easy it was to read your Bible? Because something about you had been awakened. Shall awaken. Awaken. Shall awaken again. Awaken. Because you had probably experienced this new type of awakening and you did not get tired. You could not be worn out. That is what we are in need of today. We need to be reawakened to the power of God to fall back in love with Jesus the way that we did when we first got saved. All of a sudden now, we're aware of everything. We're aware of what time service started, what time they end, how long she was bred, how many songs they sang. They've been singing this song for 12 minutes. When are we going to switch to the other song? When my favorite worship leader going to get up? But when you were first in life, when you first became saved, none of that mattered. Whoever got on the mic, you was waving your hand. You was worshiping God because you was here for the Lord and not for your friends. So we need a revival. Come on and shout revival. Revival. Come on and shout revival again. Revival. So we need a revival, but we also need this thing called revival next. These are vessels and people who can, who God can use to usher in revival. Oh, got quiet right there. You don't want to do that, but you know what we're about to go, don't you? <laughs> we need consecrated, dedicated, Individuals who are willing to lay their lives down so revival can come. Amen. That means we need people who are willing to fast. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's a tough word in church today. <laughs> I said we need people who are willing to fast yeah. for the sole purpose of revival, not so you can lose weight. We don't fast so we can lose weight. I was telling some people about the Daniel fast. They were like, what you doing? I said, well, I'm doing fruits and vegetables and water. I said, you doing the Daniel fast? No, I don't do no Daniel fast. Because if you read Daniel chapter 1, the purpose of the Daniel fast was so that they could come before the king and not look like they had not been eating. So the Bible says that they got, they was fat. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't do the Daniel fast. I don't want that Daniel fatter principle to be applied to my life. So I do the straight fruit, vegetables, and water. So if you call it the Daniel fast, I'm going to rebuke you because I do not want to get fat. Praise Jesus. So we need people that are willing to fast, that are willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord, and willing to cry out before God. So that revival can be ushered in. People got, we're going to have to do something beyond scream, Lord, send revival. Like, how long can we say that? Lord, send revival to Chicago. Lord, send revival to the South Side. At what point do we become the conduit that revival can come through? I can't hear you. At what point do we say, Lord, use me. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to fast. I'm willing to read my Bible. I'm willing to be at prayer at 5 o'clock in the morning on Friday. I'm not saying that person like I'm not going to be here on Friday. I'm <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, goodness. This feels so good to be home. You know, you be in and out. I told you, man, they be in and out of the spirit and all that. Y'all bear with me. It's okay? Yeah. All right. So, one of the, one, another type of event is the outreach event. We have an outreach event. That's someone, they probably not going to preach or teach. But they will, they will organize an outreach. Yeah. Outreach after outreach after outreach. They're going to have you on the corner doing water, popcorn, snowballs. They come over there today. Halloween, a little orange candy, they, anything. Get out there in the street. We're going to call it an outreach. But it's not an outreach unless it's an opportunity to share the gospel. And then the last type of evangelist that we have today is the 21st century evangelist. This is something new. Shout 21st century. 21st century. The 21st century evangelist, basically what they do is they utilize technology. Hallelujah. 
to get the message across. One of the scriptures that used to confuse me was John chapter 14, verse number 12. When Jesus said, the works that I do, you're going to do it. And then you're going to do greater works. That's impossible. I used to say, Jesus, how in the world I'm supposed to do the works that you need? You know, you raise people from the dead. You know, you literally, people recovered their sight. You unplugged deaf ears. You fed thousands. Who on this earth believed that you can replicate what Jesus did? But that's what he told us. He said, the works that I did, I want you to do those same things. And then, as if that wasn't scary enough, he said, and do great. How in the world can we do greater works than what he did? Well, this is one way. We do have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit because he told us. Just when I got nervous, verse 13 says that. So if you ask anything in my name, I'm going to do it. So what he's really saying is this. All the things that you saw me do, I want you to do it. But when you come and ask me to do it, I'm going to do it for you and make you feel like you did. <laughs> so it's really not us who are doing it. It's really Jesus who is doing it, but he's doing it through us. Are you listening to me? The Bible says that we have a treasure inside of this earthen vessel. That the power, the excellency of the power will be of who? God and not of us. And so what Jesus is really saying is I invested a treasure on the inside of you. And that treasure that I have invested on the inside of you, the purpose of that treasure is so that God can be glorified. And so that I will be able to use that gift that I have given you to do greater works through you. Now check this out. Jesus did not have a car. All of his ministry traveled. He either did it by foot or a camel or a mule or something like that. So the amount of time that it took Jesus to get from Jerusalem to Galilee on foot, we could probably do that same distance. The amount of time that it took Jesus to travel in four and a half years, in four years, three and a half years, almost four years. We can probably travel that same distance today in a matter of days. Because we have planes, we have trains, and we have automobiles. So we can be a little bit more mobile. Are you listening? So we can do greater works as a 21st century evangelist by simply the way that we travel. We can cover more geographical territory than what Jesus did. That makes sense? The same thing with people. Jesus didn't have a microphone. I was thinking about this earlier today. He was preaching to like thousands of people without a microphone. If you ever had the pleasure to preach or teach without a microphone to a couple of hundred, it's very difficult to project your voice in that room and in a way where everybody can hear you. What everybody can understand. And so here Jesus is, not unless something supernatural or miraculous was happening, he's out there, he's teaching, and he's preaching to like 5,000 people with no microphone, no amplified sound. He can only preach in that one particular place. He's restricted because he's human. Only in that one particular place. Now, how many of y'all use Periscope? Right there. So when you start teaching on Periscope, you can actually teach from the confines of your house. But people from Russia can actually log in and tag in. Jesus didn't have that capability. Are you listening to me? So we have the opportunity to impact the world in a greater way than even Jesus wasn't able to. Just by being 21st century evangelists and using the technology that is afforded unto us. 
So all of those people who feel like technology is of the devil, get delivered. Seriously, get delivered. Yeah. There's some demonic stuff going on on Facebook, and some of it is talking about y'all. <laughs> some of it is the same. I've been reading y'all statuses, too. I've been reading it late at night. I've been reading it. I'm like, Lord, they need deliverance. Y'all throwing all those shade posts out there trying to talk about people indirectly. Be a person of integrity. Yeah. If you're going to throw a shade post, title it like I do. Shade post. <laughs> So as 21st century evangelists, we have an advantage because we can utilize technology which would give us a greater influence with a greater audience. Why do we evangelize? Why do we, why do we place emphasis on evangelism? We do that first of all because Jesus did. That was his first proclamation and his last word. When I was a kid, they used to do this thing on Good Friday, you have the seven last words of Jesus. And they used to be like 800 words. <laughs> like the first preacher get up and preach, Father forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Then I'm like, that's more than seven words. And then the next preacher get up and he got like 13 words in his title. I'm like, somebody over here is lying. <laughs> These are more than seven words. Jesus' last words. First of all, his first words a proclamation regarding evangelism actually started in his first sermon when he started calling people. Matthew chapter 4. He called uh, uh, Andrew and Philip. Now. And he says, Andrew and Peter, he says, listen. He said, I want you all to follow me. That's how he called them. And then he gave them their assignment. He says, because you're going to follow me, but here's the deal. You're going to follow me so I can make you fishers of me. Mm -hmm. When he called his first person, first people, he called them with the purpose not to prophesy, not to plant a church, not to lead worship. The president was set of I'm going to Everybody who starts following me, you have to become a fisher of me. That is one of the last things we do in church. We do not teach and train. We definitely not going to mandate that everybody who walks through these doors learn and are equipped with becoming fishers of me. How did America get in the state that is in? Because we no longer have fishers of men. Yes. Yes. We got professional worship leaders, yes. professional minstrels. Yes. We got Bible college educated pastors and leaders. Yes. But how many fishers of men do we have? Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. We got one person in the house saved, and everybody else lives for the devil. No fishes of men. We're not even conscious about attempting to evangelize it and become fishes of men. Because that's what he evangelized. And Jesus never made that distinction. He gave this to everyone. People came out to him, he said, I'm going to teach you how to fish. In other words, I'm going to teach you how to do what I'm doing to you right now. <laughs> he called them so that they could go call them. Are you listening to me? That was their assignment. That was the first thing he told them. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, our favorite scripture about the Holy Ghost, but you shall receive power. This was his last word before he ascended back to the Father, is that I want you all to become witnesses. Come on and shout witnesses. Yes. So in his first message, he says, I want you, you're gonna, I'm going to train you how to become fishers of men. That's the first statement he made to the first people he called to come after him. And the last statement before he goes back to the Father is, I need you all to be witnesses. So I would think that this is pretty important to Jesus. And this is his first message and his last message. So how did it get lost in the church? If this is what Jesus is about, fishers of men, and becoming witnesses and giving us power to be able to witness and transform the world to the utmost parts of the earth. Where did we lose it at? Where did we recommend it to just one particular 
the ministry group. You all are the evangelism team. <laughs> all six of y'all. And y'all so full of rebellion, we can't well know what to do with you, so we're just gonna put you out there in the street, go and mess with them people, and leave us alone. <laughs> so yeah, it's okay to have an evangelism team, but it should not be only the evangelism team that's doing evangelism. All of us were instructed to go out and make disciples. Someone to shout amen to that. Yeah. Now, that was his first proclamation, and those were his last instructions. So, how do we evangelize? It's about to get good now. Y'all all right? Yes. Say, y'all all right? Yes. How do we evangelize? We evangelize according to Matthew chapter 9, verse number 35, verse number 36. This is what's missing in most evangelistic outreaches. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, he teaching, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing sickness and disease. But then he turned around. Jesus is doing his ministry. And then he turns around and see the multitudes. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Yeah. Come on and shout compassion. compassion. He was moved with compassion on them because they, they fainted. They were scattered abroad as sheep that had no shepherd. Now let's take this word, uh, compassion. The word compassion is quite different than what we believe about sympathy. Many times we believe we have a compassion for people, and really we just feel sorry for them. Mm -hmm. We just have some sympathy. So it's not sympathy, because sympathy is shared feelings of sorrow and anguish. Like, oh, I'm just so sorry for that, you know, you lost your job. You just feel very bad. Now, compassion is something different. This word compassion means, according to Webster, it means understanding the suffering of others. But get this, and doing something about it. Now, that's Webster. I believe Webster is saved, too. <laughs> His definition to me just be so prophetic. <laughs> so Webster says that compassion means understanding the suffering of others. But not just having a comprehension about it, but because of what you know about the suffering of somebody else, it makes you do something about it. That's Webster. Now, the Greek definition, like saying y'all better know this, Y'all should know the Greek terminology. <laughs> Jesus' compassion. That word compassion in the Greek uh, with Jesus, it means, y'all listen? To have your bowels yearn. So when Jesus was moved with compassion, it means his insight was turning. He was preaching. Casting out demons, teaching, healing the sick. But he turned and looked over at the multitudes who were scattered. And all of a sudden, his stomach started turning on the inside of him. Now, let me ask you this. You don't have to answer me out loud. You know, but when is the last time have your bowels ached because of the condition of somebody else? Or better yet, when is the last time you lost sleep because of somebody else? When is the last time you stayed up praying and travailing because somebody else's marriage wasn't doing good, but because yours is doing good, you still is restless because you are so moved with compassion that simply because things are going well with you, that's not good enough because you want it to go well also with your sister and your brother. Amen. Jesus, that's what moved him. And this is how come the world don't pay the church any attention. Amen. Not even when we're giving away our school supplies. <laughs> They'll come and take our book bags and our pencils and pens and calculators, and they won't come back until next year. Why? Because maybe we're not being moved with compassion. Amen. And while we're out there giving them our book bags, maybe we should also be able to understand the conditions that they are in and begin to not just sympathize but have compassion upon them yeah. to the place that it causes us to do something other 
Are you listening to me? Y'all quiet around here. Because Jesus is saying that we have to be moved with compassion. We can get them the stuff. But man, I have discerned that you're addicted to hell. So I'm going to give you this book bag for you to take on to your door. But can I pray for you? Can I break this curse of addiction off of you? Because I can't let you leave here the same way. Because I am moved with compassion to impact your life. And most of the time, the church can't move in compassion because most of the things that we need to be getting the world free of, we're still on the altar trying to get free of it ourselves. So it's difficult for us to minister to a young girl who's dealing with fornication and her baby daddy because we just left the hotel with something out of record before we came to praise and worship. So it's a little bit difficult for us to be moved with compassion for somebody else we need somebody to be moved with compassion for us. Yeah. But can't nobody be moved with compassion for us because as soon as we say we deserve fornication on you, then you get mad talking about people all in your business. <laughs> you now I got to leave the church. It is all in my business. I don't know who she thinks she is. I'm having compassion for you. Are you listening to me? Yeah. So, Jesus was moved with compassion. Come on and shout, move with compassion. Come on, y'all ain't shout that. I said, come on and shout, move with compassion. Move with compassion. His ministry was great. With his great ministry, he out there teaching, preaching, casting out demons. And then all of a sudden, he realized that the people who needed it the most wasn't getting it. He casting out devils and healing over him. Then he look at a whole nother multitude of people and says, hey, they just out here, they faint, they weak, they thirsty, they hungry, and nothing is happening with them because they just scattered. They don't have any guidance. They don't have any type of cover that can bring them into abundance. <laughs> Listen at this, y'all. I believe that Jesus was the type of leader that we have to follow. Jesus did not discern what was going on with the multitude and start whispering to the other disciples. He didn't post it on Facebook. He didn't give a tweet. He was a man of integrity. Are you listening to me? Because he understood that if he's going to be moved with compassion with the multitudes, the multitudes are going to have to trust him. I can't hear you. Yeah. So if we're going to be moved with compassion, we got to raise our integrity level so that the people we desire to help can trust us. Yeah. If they come and confide something in us, they can't see your best friend looking at them in worship and discerning that you just yeah. told your best friend. Yeah. Yeah. He modeled something different. He modeled integrity before us. He said, the people that need it the most, these multitudes over here, I'm here casting out demons, but there's a whole multitude of people that need you, need what we have, but they're not getting it. And because they're not getting it, they're weak, they're fainting, and they're scattered. One of the scriptures that bothers me quite often is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 3. It says, if our gospel is hid, it is hid to those who are lost. That's almost similar to Jesus healing, casting out demons, teaching and preaching, and then look over and see multitudes of people who don't have what his ministry is demonstrating. So Paul says, our gospel is here. But guess who is here to? To those who are lost. So how is the gospel here to people who are lost? Because people who have the gospel it's not sharing the gospel to the people who are lost. 
Because the people who have the gospel only want to share the gospel to people who already know the gospel and have already benefited from the gospel. So we're not sharing the gospel with the people who need it the most. We're sharing the gospel. Our gospel is here to them. So we wonder why the world is in the state that it's in. We wonder why ISIS is taking over. Because when is the last time you ministered to a Muslim? When is the last time we ministered to a homosexual, a transsexual, a transgender? Or heroin addict? Because the gospel is lost to them. And then even if we do attempt to minister the gospel, this is one of the areas we fail in. We present Jesus as a answer. When Jesus has to be presented as the answer. It makes us nervous to say that. Come on and shout, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Come on, say that loud. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. The problem we have with that is because we live in this all-inclusive society. That we should welcome everybody in, every idea, every religion, and we don't want to feel like we are exclusive to say that Jesus is the answer. I heard Oprah say that Jesus is one of the ways, <laughs> but he's not the only path to God, and she's supposed to be a Christian. Oh, all y'all fighting against some of her favorite things. But we have to be bold enough to present Jesus as he is. Not water him down. Not make him fit into some religious box to make people feel good about themselves. We got to be bold enough to let people know that Jesus is the answer. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the answer to homosexuals. He is the answer to crackheads.
Pastor Greg and evangelism team. Pastor Ed, you need to know when you go home that Jesus is the answer for everybody in your house. I can't hear you. Jesus is the answer for your husband. Jesus is the answer for your son. Jesus is the answer for your daughter. Jesus is the answer for your manager. Jesus is the answer for your supervisor. Jesus is the answer. Want to see how good you feel? Want to feel all warm and stirred? Why? Because you just caught that wind of revelation about this man named Jesus that you're serving. Now your job is to pass that on. Amen. You don't have to know Genesis to Revelation. All you need to know, just like the woman at the well, all she went and told people was one thing. I had an encounter with a man. You need to come see this man who did something to my life. You want to know what happened to me? I had an encounter with Jesus. That's all you need to tell people. And you're so afraid because you feel like, well, I don't know Romans Road. Well, I don't know this script, and I can't say it like that person. Well, how about sharing your personal testimony? Yeah. What has Jesus done for you lately? Yeah. What has he done for you lately? Yeah. Yeah, has he done anything since the day you got saved? <laughs> I used to hear that as a kid. That's all they talk about, the day they got saved. I'm like, man, he's been saved like 40 years. He ain't did nothing else. <laughs> he ain't paid your bills, he ain't healed your body. <laughs> I mean, he's done absolutely nothing <laughs> like in 40 years. Let me tell you, every morning we wake up, we have brand new mercy. Yeah. A lot of that stuff we've been involved in yesterday, he said, I'm going to overlook it. And I'm going to extend mercy unto you. Yeah. So that should be enough right there. Yeah. Are we doing okay? Yes. Yeah. Can we go through one more verse? We got time? We got time for one more verse? All right. I'm trying to look at him like, you know what I'm saying? The latter part of Matthew chapter 9, we did verses 36, 35, and 36. But here's the real truth of the matter. It's going to take more than a 21st century evangelist. It's going to take more than an apostolic evangelist. It's going to take more than a pastor, the apostle, prophet, and teacher. It's going to take more than that. When Jesus looked out, he saw them scattered. They was fainting. They didn't have a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples in verse number 37, Did I do something? Hold, Hold it up higher. higher. There you go. In verse number 37, he said to his disciples, He says, Hey guys, look at these people over here. They weary. They don't have any help. He says, this is a harvest over here. He addressed it as a harvest. Mm -hmm. He didn't address it as a seed, something that was in this process. He addressed it as a harvest. Saving that a harvest means the only thing you need to do is just go and pick it. It's right. Ain't, ain't no much work at the harvest. Somebody else did all the work. They did the planting, the tilling of the ground, they did the watering, they did all of that. Only thing for the harvest, you just go in and, and get and reap the benefits of it. Yeah. So he's talking to the ones who is following him. The ones who just heard him teaching the synagogue. Watched him cast out demons. Watched him heal the sick and all matters of sickness and disease. He, he talked to them people, the ones that's with him every day. And he says, There is a harvest and it is plenteous. He said, But well, ain't no laborers. It's 
nobody to go and pluck the harvest, to reap the benefits. Nobody is willing to deny themselves. Nobody is willing to consecrate and fast for Chicago, for their block, for America. Nobody wants to do it. This is what Jesus said to the ones that's following him. There, there you are. It's a harvest right there. There it is. And the disciples are just like many of us are right now. They were quiet. <laughs> they did not even say to Jesus, hey, are we going to go get We've been walking with you. Give us a chance. We need to, since it's just a harvest, all we need to do is go there and pluck. They didn't say, hey, Jesus, put me to work. Give me a trap. Jesus said, there's a harvest. Come on, fellas, there's a harvest. I need some laborers. I need somebody that's willing. They didn't say no. And then that's what Jesus did. He gave him some instructions. Well, since you ain't going to do that, just go pray then. <laughs> go and pray. Pray that the Lord will send some back. So you ain't going to go. The least you can do is pray that somebody else goes. That is the story of the church today. We all know that there's a need in Chicago Heights. We all know there's a need in Inglewood. We all know there's a need on the west side, but just knowing that there's a need and doing something about it is two different things. We're being just like the disciples. We just hang around Jesus. They're watching the miracles. They're shouting and dancing. They're falling out. But at what point do we stop that and become a laborer? At what point do we stop that and go and reach the harvest? When is the last time somebody came to the Lord because of you? When is the last time you led somebody not to Jesus, not brought him to the church like the pastor did? When is the last time you did? Where is your fruit? Of being a laborer. I know y'all ready for me to go. I got a bunch of crazy life savings. Let's go make sure y'all don't jump on me tonight. Where's the laborers? Where's the ones willing to sacrifice? To say, I'm going to make sure my family don't go to hell. If they go to hell, it's going to be because they just really, really did want to go really bad. <laughs> they went way out of their way to go to hell. Because I'm going to make sure that I have a family by my stuff. I'm going to make sure that I call my Jerusalem. That I talk to them. I'm going to make sure that I talk to my nieces and my nephews. I'm going to make sure that I reach out to my cousins. I send words of encouragement. So they're going to have to make a special effort to go to hell. Because they're not going to hell on my watch. Because I'm a laborer. You don't have to have a title as an apostle. I can't wait till we get rid of some of all of these titles and go right back to being just servants. That's all we need to be, just servants. So one of these days we're going to hear him say, servant well done. I saw that thing on Facebook and it almost made me fall out my jump out my window, even though I live on the first floor. And I almost jumped out my window. Because it says that when, when we get before the Lord, he's not going to call us apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. He's just simply going to say, servant well done. When is the body of Christ going to make servant look good again? Don't y'all remember Jim, Justin Timberlake said uh, that he was bringing sexy back? Uh, I want to bring servanthood back. Uh, can we get servanthood back uh, into the house of God? Uh, every church I go to is short uh, on workers down in the children ministry. Why don't nobody want to work in the children's ministry? Because we don't want to serve. We just want to be in the regular service so we can get it all for ourselves. That ain't nothing wrong with that. But honey, you can sacrifice one service. You, we have two services every Sunday, eight times a month. Can't you give up one just to be a servant? I can't wait until we get rid of all of these titles. I believe once we get rid of all of these titles and we stop being so intoxicated with titles and go back to just being servants, I believe the power of God is going to hit the body of Christ up as never before because our identity is going to be wrapped up in him. Then. It's not going to be wrapped up in who knows my name. It's not going to be wrapped up on the pastor calls my 
my name. It's going to be wrapped up in I am a laborer. I want to get a harvest for the king. I'm not going to do a work for the Lord. Because when he saved me, he saved me for a purpose. And his purpose was so that I could become fishers of men. He did not save me so that I could be on the worship team and prophesy. He saved me so that my family don't go to hell. He saved me so that people in my job could be introduced to the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why he saved me. Come on and shout, I want to be a servant. Come on and shout it out. I want to be a servant. I want to be a servant. You don't have to call my name. I just want to be a laborer. Just let me labor. Just let me serve. Because that's what he called me to do. All the other stuff is just extra. And when we grab this concept, I guarantee you, America will change. Not just America. I believe our families will change. Not just our families. I believe your neighbor families will change. And the world will change. Once we humble ourselves, realize what we were created for, and stop being so full of ourselves, and get filled. The Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I mean, be filled all the way up with Him yeah. so that we can serve. Go on, put your hands together on the Lord. Let's just worship God for a minute as Pastor Greg come. I'm done. I'm done. Let's ask God to, to help me be a servant. Let's let me be a servant. Let me, let me be one that, that the world is impacted because of my servanthood. I just want to be a servant. Let me serve from a pure place in my heart. Not so people could call my name and give me accolades. I don't need the certificate. I don't need to shout out. I just want to serve. In any capacity that's needed, what my gift is can be a blessing. I just want to serve. And people of God, those of us who are in leadership, when people come hungry to serve, we got to have a pathway for them to serve. We can't tie them up in red tape. We got to yeah. let them serve. Yeah. Yeah. Are you listening to me? Come on and lift your hands. Lord, make me a servant. The harvest, the harvest is so, it is so plenteous in Chicago. We got gunfire. We got gangs. We got vice lords, the disciples, poor, poor, the hunters, the lag kings. But where are the laborers? Where are the laborers? Will you be one? Will you mentor someone? Will you disciple someone? Will you sacrifice your time for another young lady? Will you disciple another couple? What a servant. Lord, make me a servant. Well, look at me. You talk to the Lord now. Don't wait for me to lead you. This has to be a decree out of your own heart. Lord, I want to be a servant. I want to be a servant, Jesus. Thank you. you said that the, the harvest is brilliant. But the labor is up to you. I don't want you to look past me and just tell me to just pray for some laborers because I won't yield myself. I'm yielding to you now, Jesus. Take all of me. All of me. All of me. All of my gifts, I just give them to you. All of my talents, I just surrender them back to you and say, Lord, you can use them for your glory. You gave me this treasure in this earthen vessel. Not so I can use it to get rich. Not so I can use it to be famous. But you gave me this to advance your kingdom so that the world will know that this excellent thing inside of me is because of you. I give you my gift. I give you my gift. I give you my talent. Willingly, I lay it down. And I say, Jesus, use it for your glory. I make a bold declaration tonight. Ask him to use it outside of the church. Whatever your treasure, whatever your gift is, ask him, how can I use it outside of the church? So that I can win some. So that they'll come believers of you. So they'll become disciples of you. So that every time they'll begin 
to make other disciples. I give you my heart, my gifts, my talents, my treasure, my ego, my pride. And even for those of you who are saying, I'm just so afraid to talk to strangers. Come on, give them that fear tonight. And say, Jesus, you are the lion. You are the lion from the tribe of Judah. Let your oldest be infused into me right now. Fill my mouth, Lord, with words. Give me the tongue of the learn so I can use it. That I know how to give a word in season to those who are weary. Let not fear be my stumbling block any longer. Let not fear constrain me any longer. But Lord, I give you my fear. And teach me your voice, Holy Spirit. So that I know to go and know when to go and what to say. And I have the assurance that it is you. Come on, talk to the Lord. <laughs>